this is an interview with uh, English Don on Bikers in a Circle Live. And uh, English Don, I, I did research on you when I first met you back in the day, and I, I seen a bunch of cool videos and stuff. Uh, you running around with cameras and Sturgis and all that stuff. And uh, way back, uh, and I want to tell you, man, uh, you were way before your time because uh, the cool stuff you were doing is – Kind of like I'm doing now, except the internet uh, just didn't catch up. You were way before your time. Uh, the internet still had dial up, and it was really hard for you to, you know, uh, get your stuff on the internet and, and get it shown quick and stuff. And uh, I just want to let you know, man, uh, you're my mentor and uh, one of the guys that got me into doing stuff like this. So uh, I really appreciate it. So, so how did you uh, go about getting into the uh, internet and stuff like that back in uh, the old school way? And then FedEx the stuff overnight back to the studio to have it edited and then put up on on the net the next day, so people could see you know what went on at Sturgis the day before. But you know we did our best, and uh, I'm glad to see you. You picked up the. Uh, Picked up the ticket and ran with it. You know what I mean? It's, it's great stuff you're doing here. The bike is, uh, in a circle is fantastic. You've really done wonders with it, Charlie. Well, man, I tell you, uh, I got into this, you know, because I uh, I've seen so many stories out there when I was playing with my band, and uh, TV wasn't doing it justice, man. <clears throat> the bike building shows and uh, the Tuttles and uh, Jesse James and uh, just it wasn't really the guys that I knew, you know, like, uh, the guys that really just, man, just cared about the brotherhood and didn't really care about the money and stuff. And you yeah, proving my point. I mean, a lot of you guys don't have, you're just like uh, a lot of the blues guys, uh, great musicians, uh, love blues and, and wind up not having any money and stuff, you know, and, uh, that proves the point right there that, uh, the passion is what you're, and is dear to you. Yeah, that that that's the that's the God's honest truth, right there. Um, we uh, we do it for the love. I mean, uh, at my age now, uh, to be honest with you, uh, to to still be living at the back of a motorcycle shop with my dog and all, uh, uh, as uh, sick as I am, well, I could have been somewhere else in my life had I chose to, but you just can't get away from it, you know. It, it's it's what I live for. It's what I love to do. Um, that and music, uh, and, and, and you know what else do you what else do you need? You know. Well, you know, just you like know? just like uh, John Lee Hooker, he passed away in his sleep. He 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 played music all the way until the end, and uh, uh, you know, I, I plan on doing the same thing, man. And uh, I'm gonna dedicate my whole show to you at the Buffalo Chip, August third, uh, where we raise money for the Sturgis Museum, and I'm opening up for War. And I'm trying to get some pictures sent over to the Buffalo Chips so where they can show them on the big screen while I'm playing. And uh, like I say, we're going to dedicate the whole show to you, brother. Oh, that, that's, that's really, really super kind of you. I, I can't thank you enough. And if you need any more info, I'll be glad to get it to you. Uh, we got some good pictures uh, at the indie show. I'm sure you'll use those. That was a yeah. great night, and I enjoyed that night watching you on stage and uh, Enjoying you there for a while. Yeah, that was the uh, first time I really got to meet you and uh, hang out with you, man, and it was an honor, dude. Yeah, it was an honor to meet you too, man. We've uh, we've been friends now, like over the air, what for a couple of three years now. And yeah, yeah, and uh, we hit know. it. We hit it off right away. I mean, it was, you know, goes without saying. Well, you know, man, it's uh, I've been in this thing so long, and I've been you know taught right and raised right, and uh. I can kind of tell uh, five minutes in a conversation uh, if I if it's a good thing or it ain't. And, uh, you know, my grandfather taught me a long time ago, you know, you can run through a lot of money, but a conversation, a good conversation is something worth more than, more than money. And uh, uh, I've had some great conversations with you, man. And uh, to me, uh, uh, holding a conversation with a, a person that, uh, is fluent and uh, intelligent and, and passionate about what they do, and it don't not just just motorcycles and anything. If you can sit down with somebody and hold a, a great conversation, uh, to me that's worth more than all the money in the world. Yeah, 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 exactly, man. I remember when um, when we first got that video hook up. 
together between us uh, a few years ago, and then and we both had the, the Dave Mann uh, Ghost Rider picture on the wall. The same, you remember that? I yeah. Had the, the one signed copy, and you have yours up on the wall in the studio. Yeah. Uh, isn't this rude? Someone calls me right now. Hold on. Well, that's second, okay, guys. man. Hey, this is live radio. It's all good. Folks, we're listening. Uh, we're checking out uh, English Don live uh, right now, and uh, we're talking about some uh, cool stuff uh, back in the day. That, well, know? that's okay, man. Hey, it's <laughs> but, live radio. Uh, yeah, so um, I guess everyone knows that uh, I've gotten a little sicker than I, than I was um, uh, a few years ago. And... Uh, that's kind of a kick in the ass. I mean, I've been fighting illness since around 2004, and I had gotten better, and then I made it to the top of the list for the liver transplant in England, and uh, then they turned me down, and then they gave me four years to live instead, you know, and said wow. my quality of life would be better than the chances of me dying on the slab. So, well, now those four years are up, and um, I started getting pretty ill here and my body started swelling up and all those symptoms of of uh, you know progressive organ failure and yeah well, i got admitted to hospital this last week and uh, and they did the full testing on me and um sad news is they found a, a tumor on my uh, liver and a, a couple of other uh, lumps in my chest and uh, a few other things going wrong so um now it's uh pick up the pick up the sword and go back at it and battle it again, I guess. Yeah. Well, you know, you know, me and you got a lot in common, brother, and and that's why uh, this is really touching home with me because, you know, uh, I have hepatitis C too, and uh, uh, they wanted me to take that medicine years ago, and I refused to take it, and I just quit drinking alcohol and everything, and uh, uh, my levels all went down, and I don't have any symptoms. I'm pretty healthy, but uh. Uh, I went and got checked uh, right before I left uh, for Russia, and they told me that I went up a mill. So uh, in the winter time, I'm going to go sign up and uh, take that in Furon or whatever it's called. Furon, yeah. Yeah, I'm going to go went take it. Two, two bouts of that, uh, and the last time I had a horrible allergic reaction to it, so yeah. that's pretty much off the table now. Yeah, well, I got a couple of friends that went through the medicine and uh they it beat it you know they and uh, uh i'm praying to god that i'm one of those people that uh, can take the medicine and be okay and uh, a lot of the reason why i didn't take the medicine is uh one i was kind of scared uh and the other one was i'm always playing so it was hard to take the medicine and sit on the couch when i got to provide for my family you know so yeah but then i thought about it man i mean i can't provide for them if i'm uh if you know, if I don't take care of this, so I'm gonna take a uh, all winter off and uh, just uh, take care of myself. You know, so uh, anyway, uh, you said there's a, a website or something uh, people can donate money and stuff. Can you tell us uh, what that is? Yeah, not off the top of my head because I, oh. I don't hold the information in my head. My head's like a sieve. But okay. on, uh, on well, Facebook, we'll... Yeah. if you go on to my page, or uh, there's a cat named Rich Hayes who's a uh, He's uh, writing my book with me, and now he's set up a, a donation website and uh, to help out with medical costs. And any money donated to it um, goes uh, is held in escrow by uh, John Randazzo at Biker Law. So there's, there's no uh, funny business. Or if anyone uh, might think that we're scamming money or anything, we're not. And in fact, it wasn't even my idea. It's another great cat who's a who's a you know, willing to help out, he even offered me a chunk of his liver, but um, uh, that may, it may be past that point now, because um, if if they go in and remove the tumor, it may not be worth saving that liver, so it might be transplant time, which kind of annoys me, because I had made it to the top of the list, you know, those years ago, and then they could have done it then and there, and I would have been uh, either number one dead, or I've been happy with a new functioning liver uh, by now. So, but that's the way things go, you know. Uh, in the me medical business, it's all about um, you know availability, number one, and also saving a buck, you know. Well, you so, know, we, we we're gonna do a concert over here for you. I'll set it all up, and uh, all the money that we make, we'll we'll send over to you, brother. And uh, 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 folks, I, I apologize if. Uh, 
my uh, line cut off for a little bit. You know, it's that new technology shit. Uh, it still ain't really caught up with what we really want to do yet, English Don. I mean, uh, uh, but I, <laughs> yeah, I, I, know. I have the whole thing. Yeah, I have the whole thing recorded uh, on my other system, and uh, so if you missed anything, I'm gonna have it all put up uh, on Facebook and YouTube. So uh, we'll be okay with that. Hey, so. Um, what I wanted to talk to you about is uh, how you got into riding motorcycles and how, how'd you come over to the States and uh, meeting Andy and Larry and, all, and the Bayonet brothers and all that cool stuff. Well, how I got, got into riding motorcycles is, is uh, the same as a lot of guys in Europe, especially when I grew up. Um, not, not like uh, some, of the, some of the American people over here. Uh, no offense, uh, you know, daddy buys your car when, when you graduate high school. We weren't that, you know, nobody's got that kind of money where I, where I grew up. And <clears throat> basically, if you weren't out there working <clears throat> by the age 15 or 16 and paying rent, kicking back rent to the household, you know, um, you, you were out on your ear. So uh, not many people could afford cars. So you could get a motorcycle, you know or a bicycle or whatever to get to work, you know, and, and um, or a moped or something like that. I mean, Europe is full of mopeds and bicycles, and that's almost where I start. Um, so I got into that. You know, back then I bought, uh, bought my old BSA back in, I think, 1977 or 1978, something like that, and, and rode that thing till the wheels dropped off. And, uh, and when I was playing... Um, Rockabilly music with with Levi and Rockheads uh, uh, and and, and uh, cutting wood, uh, you know, for a living too. Uh, you know, you had, to, you had to get around, and what better way than a motorcycle? Plus, I love motorcycles, so uh, and that was the first bike I started modifying. Um, uh, also, in, out of necessity, you know, uh, I fell down three times in one day in the snow. <laughs> so, kept kept breaking there. things off. And then going to the bike shop, getting a new foot peg, getting a new turn signal or whatever, putting it back on. And by the third time down, I said, oh, bollocks to it. And just took the hacksaw and cut the fuckers off. So that was my first modification was getting rid of the turn signal. And, it, you know, it went on from there. And, and I'd always, always read about the American biker and, and just loved the whole culture. And read all the magazines till they were dog-eared and, and, um, you know, I just wanted to come to America. I think it's the greatest place on earth, and it is. It's, it's the best country in the world. They're the most warm people, most fantastic, fantastic country to live in. Uh, you got everything here, you know, uh, to look at, to, to be who you want to be. I mean, it really is true. America is such a wonderful place. So I decided that uh, after... Um, you know, after a few tussles with the law and uh, in and out of the pokey uh, uh, at a young age, but, uh, I was a mock man, and, and I didn't really want to be there. So at the age of 21, I um, I took what money I had, which was about 400 pounds, and hopped the plane and came to New York. And um, I only know a few people in New York, which was my old band members, the Rockettes and, and the great Lee Childers uh, manager. He was the Simon Cowell of the of the 70s, he's a wonderful guy, and, uh, and, and cats like Billy Idol and a few other guys, and uh, I landed here in New York and uh, sort of stayed for a, a while, just under a year or so, and I went back and um, tried to settle back into English life again, and it just wouldn't happen, so I, you know, again, scraped the money and came back, back over and decided that this is where I wanted to be, and and pursue my dream of, of, you know, riding and wrenching the big American motorcycles and uh, and playing rock and roll, and that's what I wanted to do. And I said, well, that's what I'm going to do. I'm not going to do what other people tell me I'm supposed to do. So that's how, I, you know, that's how I came out here and started doing that. Um, and here I am, you know. And I started, uh, I think... The first bike I got when I was here was an old Honda 360 and uh, worked my way up to uh, a, a VSA 650 chopper that I built and, and started riding with uh, a bunch of guys uh, from Queens, New York, the Queens crew. Uh, a little older than me and they kind of took me under the wing and 
sort of had prospects in front of him a little bit, I guess you could call it. And, and then, um, you know, music wasn't putting food on the table, so I was cutting a bit of wood too. And then um, I decided, well, let me give my hobby, which was a motorcycle, I guess you could call it, uh, a try. And myself and Steg von Heinz, a uh, fellow musician, he was playing guitar for my band at the time. And um, we decided to... Uh, Built a couple of bikes, so we went to a few swap meets and got some junk and knocked out a couple of bikes, picked up a few cheap choppers, you know, and, and moved them on and said, well, hey, there's some money in this. And so we had to find an angle to get into uh, the business, really, and uh, nobody was doing uh, towing for motorcycles, so bought a couple of old vans and a flatbed and, and advertised that way and started towing motorcycles 24 hours a day. And uh, that was a niche that nobody had covered yet, so we were in, you know, without stepping on anyone's toes. <laughs> you know what I mean? So, uh, you know, that was back in the late 80s, uh, early 90s, and, and it, it progressed from there, Charlie. I mean, the, there were no Harley Davidson shops in, in the city of Manhattan. We started in Queens, and I saw there were a few bike shops in Manhattan, but they were all Jap shops. And, yeah. and um, so moved on in there, got a job as a Harley tech at psychotherapy, and then within, within a year, had made enough money to move my own shop, ST Cycle, in, uh, into Hell's Kitchen, and, and Steak did the same with Psycho Cycle downtown, and, you know, a couple of years later, we had two great chopper shops, you know, and then, uh, uh Indy and Larry joined, uh, Steg's outfit, and, uh, and we started the Chopper Wars, and, uh, and that was a probably the best time of my life with the old Iron Horse magazine when David Snow was the editor. Yeah. Um, he really brought the, the New York City chopper scene. That was the good old <laughs> days. Yeah. Uh, now, uh, now, when you first met Indy and Larry, uh, you guys, like, hit it off right off the top, or did you bump heads, or how, how was that first meeting? Well, the first meeting? Well, no, we didn't bump heads. You know? See, Larry had a, a reputation that, that went uh, ahead of him for a couple of things and, and, and a couple of other things too, you know. <laughs> I take people, I, I take people as they come, and and you know, I got to meet him uh, a couple of times when he had his Indian, uh, just on the street and that, and sort of say hello and you know, and nod to the head and uh, admiring his work and stuff. And then uh, he kind of disappeared for a while, and and then uh, when we had the shops up and running, uh, uh, he joined Steg's outfit and. Uh, and uh, helped get that thing up and running, and I was uptown, so uh, we were kind of, I guess, wrenching against each other, if, if you know what I mean. Uh, and, and like I said, Iron Horse was covering that whole New York City scene, and um, we were pretty much getting uh, most of the front covers and center folds for, for, for a good part of the 90s. Uh, and it became this sort of battle of who can get the next cover or who can get, you know, so it was trying to outdo each other. And then so we gained a mutual respect for each other. And, um,